The music vendor, and welcome to the Friday Rock Show. The greatest fans we have, the Deep Purple Nobody's Perfect set. We have words from four of the lads. Ian Face, Roger Glover, Ian Dillon, and Richie Blackmore. Plus tracks from the new Double Live album. And following the pubs, all in all, it's going to be good. Right, it's time now for our Deep Purple Nobody's Perfect special. The voice tracks that you're going to hear were literally recorded on top of a mountain just outside Frankfurt in an old, old castle surrounded by people who were throwing spears, they were doing archery, they were chucking axes, they were eating and drinking uh, um, roast ox and mead and very good salads for the vegetarians, of which there were quite a number. And it was all sort of recorded in that great ambience. So you're going to hear Ian Pace, Roger Glover, Ian Gillen and the very enigmatic Richie Blackmore talking about Nobody's Perfect, okay, in this segment. But let's start with something that, uh, well, it's a classic from their original live classic album, The Perps, and this version, and I'll let him do the work. It's uh, a song which is also from the last album. It tells the story of how we recorded it and what went wrong when we did it. it happened in Switzerland, the song's thing called Smoke on the Water. Hi, I'm Ian Pace. I'm a drummer. Why did we make a live record? Once we broke through our own personal barrier of making live records with Made in Japan back in 1970, 71, whatever it was, uh, we realized that they could not only be fun, they could be uh, handy little documents of how songs progress from when you make a, a studio album to how they come out when you actually play them in front of people. Made in Japan was a, a very, very tight album. We, we recorded it over three days. Um, and you were very conscious of tape turning and playing maybe a little more precisely and more correctly than you normally would on a live gig. With this one, we, we taped every night and you forgot about the tape rolling, um, which made for a very honest record. You actually, you, you will hear the good bits and you'll hear the mistakes and you'll hear the funny bits and uh, the naughty bits and the bits that went wrong and the bits that went bang and crack and pop. We got an honest picture of what happened on last year's touring. But it goes back to the, the Made in Japan record, which showed us that live records can be a lot of fun to look back on, because they're a document of the time. Uh, we thought it might have been a bit premature, with only the two new records to, to work on. A lot of the songs uh, have been recorded before, live and studio. A great percentage from Made in Japan, but they are removed by those number of years and they are different uh, and just as valid because they are different the music stands up I think with its little flaws and with its, with its little bits of magic and just to look back on those little bits of time personally uh, is quite gratifying when they come right Hello I'm Roger Glover I'm the bass player of Deep Purple I think um this band in particular, and probably applies to most bands, when they play live, they're really being much more honest than they are in the studio. On stage, you are what you are, not what you'd like to be. And uh, certainly as far as this band is concerned, uh, a great deal of spontaneity goes on stage. I mean, you know, the, the basic set doesn't differ much night to night, but the songs do differ. <laughs> and also songs change a lot from studio recordings into live performances. They, ch they undergo a change. And on this last tour... Uh, it was my dream, if you like, to get a machine, a 24-track, on the road with us every night and record every night. Because when you're touring, there's, there's good nights and there's bad nights. Every band goes through this. You go through ups, ups and downs, and especially when there's five people. It's like a, a marriage, so it's, it's five times more complicated. But there are those nights when you, you go on, the crowd is great, and you feel great, and you play great, and the, the, the combination is something... Un indescribable, it's, it's magic and you thought, oh, if only we'd recorded tonight and I've been through enough of those nights that I thought the only way to do this live album was really to get a 24 track on the road all the time if you've got a mobile there, you're very aware that the red light's running and people tend to play safe because they don't want to make mistakes <laughs> um, and really it's the mistakes I think that people want to hear, well maybe not mistakes but the spontaneous 
combustion that happens between the, especially in a band like Deep Purple, where the chemistry is finely tuned. And when we got in the studio and I started messing around with the tapes, I, I think it's an experiment that paid off because I think it's captured this band the, the way it is, not the way we'd, we'd like it to be, but the way it is. Holy, holy, what a loss. What Production a loss. in the studio, to me, uh, is getting performances out of the artist. And most musicians, I think, aren't really aware of their strong points. They project what they think are their strong points, but that's not necessarily the case. Usually the first go they have at something, whether it's a band or, or a, like an overdub from a, an individual, the first few times they do it is the best, because they're still searching, like for example, uh, a vocal or, or, or a solo, Richie or John. The first time they do it, they maybe make a few mistakes, but they're searching, and what they're doing is using their ingenuity to make what they're playing fit the track, the, the chord sequence or the riff or whatever. Uh, and the more you do it, the more sterile it becomes. And that's always the big danger of studio work. On stage, the audience is the producer. The audience is the one that supplies the adrenaline and the atmosphere in which the guy can solo or sing or play or whatever. Uh, we probably recorded about 30 or 40 dates. But you kind of had a feeling after a date whether it was worth keeping or not. We kept, I think, 17 or 19 dates worth of tapes, which is still a lot of tape. It's very easy to record a live show and then go in the studio and doctor it put new vocals on, new solos on. In fact, there's some recordings I've heard where the only thing live is the audience at the end of it. And I think having done Made in Japan, which is a 100% honest album, it was absolutely live, and also being in a band that's been bootlegged numerous times, and the reason for the, the success of those bootlegs or the popularity amongst the fans is because they're honest, because they're real. And with that in mind, my main uh, concern was that it should be as honest as any bootleg. There should be no overdubs in the studio, no tidying up. Now, having said that, I did do a bit of tidying up, but only in the extent that I took performances from other dates and married them together. Like, for example, in some instances, uh, a couple of vocal lines may have come from a date in Oslo while the track was recorded in Vienna. Uh, to me, that's honest enough, you know, to make it a good album. And I think, as an experiment, uh, I must say, I'm very pleased with it. I think it's a, a document of, of a live Deep Purple gig. This is Ian Gillen of Deep Purple. The real problem I have with live albums is that, or, or listening to live tapes or playbacks of the shows that we've done the day or two before, is that you can't smell it. You know, the feeling isn't entirely there. The, the, uh, the atmosphere, I, as I remember it, is rather like the difference between radio and television and the difference between a book and a film. You know, you read a book and you, you, you develop characters and images that when you see the film is somebody else's interpretation. Uh, a live show, I think, is exactly that. Everyone comes out of it having had something slightly different. If I've learned one thing, and it's that we've kind of relearned all the things that maybe we forgot. Because there's certainly an equal level of energy and uh, dynamism. Sound is different, times have changed, techniques have changed. Uh, <laughs> the songs haven't changed much <laughs> but uh, there are some it's nice also to hear perfect strangers and knocking at your back door in amongst smoke and highway star and that sort of thing fitting in very nicely yeah, you may be wondering why the chicken's on, on, on the front of Hush as opposed to the wolf which was on the original version well I'm wondering too I think actually as it was a live recording, it's just an indication of what time we got back from the pub. We were locked into the pub that night, and I think one of the windows must have been open. And it was around the break of dawn, and the cockerels started crying, and we sprang into life, picked up the guitars and said, wow, we just got to record this song right now, because that cockerel just started crying. For years and years and years, I've heard everyone in the band talking about one of the interesting things about Deep Purple is the spontaneity. You know, the, there's this great spontaneity. It's true, it's different every night. The show is completely different. People come to Deep Purple shows just to see how different it was from last night. But for spontaneity, read incompetence on my behalf. <laughs> so, <laughs> the rest of the guys are spontaneous. I'm basically incompetent. So, but I can call it spontaneity um, because I'm mixing in quality company. So here we have... Um, 
Nobody really knows what they're doing. Bridgie freaks out and decides he's going to play a different tune. So I go, all right, knees up another brown. Or uh, Running Bear, an old Johnny Preston tune, which I love and used to introduce as an American, a true American folk song. Actually, I think most of this started when I was with Black Sabbath for a year. And uh, I couldn't... I loved the guys. I mean, Tony and Keys, it was great working with them. It was a kind of... It was a, a day job, really. You know, I was on wages for a year. <coughs> and I loved every moment of it. But the thing is, I couldn't whip up that much enthusiasm for Iron Man and all this sort of thing. And it was just really hard to learn all these words. And I couldn't learn them, so the missus wrote them all out one night in a book for me. So I had these uh, monitors on the front, which weren't plugged in, just purely to conceal the book, which was on the floor. Am I going on a bit, or what? So anyway, this was all fine. The first night just went great, because nothing was working anyway. And I was just able to very adroitly turn the pages with my foot. Uh, the second night, when <clears throat> the dry ice machine started working really well, <laughs> and reached the front of the stage, and uh, suddenly I realized that he was all my life... My professional life was disappearing in a cloud of smoke, so to speak. So I had to drop to my knees and actually start waving my hands around to clear the smoke away from the lyrics of uh, Iron Man or uh, Zombie 8, the creature from the netherworld or whatever it was we were doing. And somebody shouted out, oh, he's doing his Ronnie Dio impression. Because <laughs> I was on my knees, right? <laughs> so, uh, it just... It just went on from there, I suppose. I lost interest in all aspects of professionalism from that time on. <laughs> okay, Richie, it's been said that you've always had a thing about castles anyway. You actually... Yes, I have. Yeah, you, you're a man that's, I think, gone around the world looking at castles and feeling that castles have got something to offer you in terms of, what is it, history you like? Uh, I think it's the, basically the low payment. I, I'm into um, the non-expensive hotels. Mm -hmm. was, uh, for instance, we were in Holzburg, um, near the east border, and we paid 26 marks a night, something like four pounds a night. Mm -hmm. and it's, it's more like a youth hostel. And that's the type of thing that I'm trying to get in to grips with. Can I ask you though, why are we here? Why are we in this? I mean, there's, there's no roof here for a start. I know. But why are we here launching the new album? That's a very good question. And um, I really don't know why we're here. And I thought that you might know why we're here. I think that maybe we're here because you wanted us to be here. I think that uh, basically we're here because this is the, this was the, the starting point of all music. Mm -hmm. Castles, rock. We're into rock. We're surrounded by rock. Rock is what it's all about. If you had tried to have performed here, it would have had to have been an acoustic set. Deep Purple couldn't have done it. An acoustic set would have been very difficult here, yes. We could have performed an acoustic set, and I think, in fact, we did many moons ago. I think if one is to uh, be into reincarnation, this is where, personally, and I'm being very serious, of course. would like to be. I would like to be, 500 years ago, I would like to be right where I am now, with lots of money in an old castle. This particular castle represents the ambience of rock and roll. It's self-contained, it's powerful, and we're filling the earth. And to fill the earth, and to fill rock and roll in Germany, is a wonderful feeling. This may seem like a devilish ploy, but it's one way to bring the proceedings to an end. You are good. You are fantastic. Thank you. And there you have it, that is, or rather was, our Deep Purple Nobody's Perfect Special. The double album and single CD and cassette version are coming out, I think it's next Monday. Check in your local press for details. I'd like to thank all the gentlemen who appeared on the show, Richie Blackmore, Ian Gillen, Ian Pace and Roger Glover. Thank you very much for your hospitality. Also thanks to George McManus, Apollodor International and the two girls who were very, very helpful. And also to Colin and everybody from Thames Talent in the United States of America who helped organize the, the jaunt over there to Frankfurt in Germany. John Lord never quite made it to Frankfurt at all. Big John's probably listening. I hope he is in his hovel in Henley at the moment. Big John, he would have loved it. It was painless. It was a really great occasion. Anyway, John, hope to talk to you soon. Gentlemen of Deep Purple, nobody's perfect. <laughs> Thanks,
once again to everybody in Deep Purple and their management for their assistance. The Friday Rock Show, as always, is a Tony Wilson production. See you next Friday. Good night.